so we begin to search for the the uh, context is what Gardner's getting at, and the idea of listing uh, parallels, parallelomania. Uh, and now, now there is a scholarly, a proper scholarly use for parallels. Of course, everything is essentially compared parallels, but he, he picks on Thomas Stuart Ferguson because he was the most egregious to abuse the parallels theme, where he lists 311 separate parallels as points that he contended were demonstrations of the context, the culture of the Book of Mormon from the Old World and the parallels between the Old World and the New World. They had 311 of them. And while the accumulated effect was pretty impressive, the problem is individually they all just simply fell apart on a real close, rigorous, intellectual examination, which is precisely what good scholarship does. Otherwise, we end up with muddled, stupid conclusions. Whereas when we use rigorous, intellectual, logical, rational, historical analysis, we get a more realistic approach. We get a more realistic understanding of the actual state of things. That makes sense? We use our brains. Martin Raich the head of the uh, library up there at BYU-Idaho, wrote about this in his article on Fool's Gold. All that shines and glitters is not gold for the Book of Mormon in archaeology. Here's why. Many LDS writers provide what I call shopping lists to prove their points. They assemble rather impressive-looking lists of words or customs or architectural parallels between the old and the new world, see? And the longer the list, of course, the greater the so-called proof is for the Book of Mormon. Well, unfortunately, such an approach is rarely of any real value. To be meaningful, such a list must cite a complex system or a unique manner that is only unique between the two cultures being compared. Now, that makes sense. Gardner agrees with this. He said, To find the correct picture does not require single points of correspondence between cultures. What it requires is complex correspondences. And without giving away the details, Gardner has six volumes demonstrating complex correspondences instead of individual parallel points. The Book of Mormon stands up well, in other words. And I'll get into the details as I do more videos, you know, through the course of time. Right now I'm just kind of introducing Gardner to you and showing you how intellectual rigor and philosophical analysis and proper scholarly historical inquiry give us a stronger faith, not a weaker faith. It doesn't undermine the Book of Mormon. It helps enlighten us about the actual nature of the Book of Mormon. What rigorous study and analysis does is it refutes weak assumptions that we have. And that's always valuable. That is the true scientific spirit. You don't just accept anything and everything ever said. You test the issues. Yeah, I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and he talks about the complex system. And, of course, a text and the archaeology of a region that the text arose in don't always necessarily have an exact and perfect match, and it doesn't have to. And that kind of sounds like a cop-out in some respects, doesn't it? You say, yeah, well, you're leaving yourself an escape hatch. But consider the biblical archaeologist and scholar, uh, Frank Moore Cross, one of the truly great biblical scholars. Consider what he says about archaeology in the Bible. There is seldom a perfect correlation between dirt archaeology and historic texts, even when both of them are right. Really? Yeah. Consider. I doubt that Biblical Archaeology, Cross says,
can ever establish that the traditional events of Israel's early epic are historical. And certainly, the archaeologist cannot prove these events were truly interpreted, even if they are established as historical. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Archaeology can't prove the historicity of the text. It doesn't necessarily match. That doesn't mean the text is false. That just means it doesn't match. Why is that, though? There is a perfectly beautiful, rational, realistic reason why text and archaeology don't always correspond exactly. And it's not because we're copping out. It's because of the realistic situation that we find ourselves in. Here it is. This is beautiful. This is on page 8 of, uh, of Gardner. <clears throat> now, saying that we don't need uh, to find a perfect fit is very different from saying that we ignore archaeology. That is not what is being proposed. No? Uh-uh. Well, the connections must be plausible. Notice there's no talk of proof. Never is in archaeology and history. I promise there's no valid archaeologist or historian on this planet or on Mars. And none of the Quaker men who live on the moon, like Joseph Smith is accused of teaching, which he didn't, none of them have proof either. I'm being a sarcastic laugh, would you? <laughs> hey, that's the value of video. You can see when I'm serious and you can see when I'm joking, you know. It's much better than the written text. Well, Disjunctions with the data are allowable. Why? Because it is impossible to prove a negative. Now, you've heard that before, but it really is. It is impossible to prove a negative. Consider. While it is true that we do not find any Jewish menorahs, that is, the seven-branched candlestick that was in the Temple of Solomon, and, of course, they made other menorahs, carvings, and little pendants and stuff. None of this has been found in Mesoamerica. This does not, however, prove, because it's absent in Mesoamerica, that a colony of Jews could not have come and lived in the Americas. You can't say the absence of the menorah is proof Jews never lived here. That's not how evidence works. On the other hand... We cannot assert that a certain land mass was underwater at a time when archaeology has absolutely demonstrated people were living on that land. You see, that kind of a disjunction refutes the hypothesis. That's a positive refutation. One reason for allowing some discontinuity between archaeology and text comes from the different world views of each. Did you think about that? You know, there really is, on, on, on pondering this for the last several days, and looking through some of my archaeology texts and biblical scholarship and stuff, it, it's not necessarily the case that the archaeology uh, find or discovery or area that a scholar is looking in has the same worldview as a text, even if it's discovered in the archaeological ruin they might have a completely different worldview. Very interesting, isn't it? In the words of the archaeologist John R. Bartlett, principal of the Church of Ireland Theological College in Dublin, he says, the artifacts need interpreting. The texts need interpreting. <laughs> Artifacts and texts each have different origins, different contexts, and they speak of different things. And you know, when you read that, <laughs> you can't help it, you say, no, duh. It's, it's beautifully reasonable and logical, isn't it? But that is the nature of the reality. Here. It's not just being a cop-out because, oh no, there's no archaeological context for the Book of Mormon. There may not be. On the other hand, there may be. It's a matter of interpretation, isn't it? 
Really? Well, both the artifacts and the texts are needed, however, even if they don't necessarily throw direct light onto each other. Archaeology is a modern undertaking. Yeah, the ancients never thought of archaeology. <laughs> that's, that's our day, you know. That's us. Because of our concept of history and, and reality. You see, the ancients did not think in that nature. It's rooted in our understanding of the scientific method, you see. Well, an ancient text, on the other hand, typically proceeds from a rationale that is foreign to our modern conceptions. And he has a beautiful example here from the Maya world. Now, I, and I know that this is accurate information that Gardner's given, because I've read it in some of my Maya scholarly texts that I have, from the archaeologists and ethno-historians and translators. This is so interesting. The Maya conceived of history as continually repeated cycles. Okay, this was the Maya concept. Cycles. Now we, of course, have linear time. You know, right now it's almost AD 2012. We only have one year, brothers and sisters, and then the world goes kaboom. According to the doomsday series. Ooh. You know, 2012, the big year. 2012 of what? It's been 2012 years from the birth of Christ way back then. Ours is a linear timeline. This is not the Maya conception. Theirs is cyclical. Circles. It repeats and repeats and repeats. And this is critical. Here's why. The Maya historians in antiquity did not necessarily record what was happening or what they did. They didn't record the reality of what happened in history, like we moderns think is the only proper and honest way to approach history. Well, history, what is it? Well, it's what happened in the past. That's our conception. <laughs> you see, well, it's what really happened. And of course, anybody who wants to know the truth will write down what actually happened. But the Maya historians did not do this. They actually fitted their history into the patterned time. They actually warped the truth and reality of what actually happened and wrote it so that it fitted into their cultural construct of their philosophy of time. And that distortion of history is what we would call it, but that distortion of history was their reality. Mm -hmm. David Stewart's big on this. I'm telling you, this is the Mayan concept. Now this is so interesting because the past foretold the future because the future repeated the patterns from the past in cyclical history. Well, Merce Iliada, huge on this. The myth of the eternal return. Yeah. Such manipulation of historical data, you notice this, this type of manipulation of historical data for cultural purposes pervades the ancient Maya texts, yet is rarely apparent in the reconstructions from the dirt. Wow! That is so accurate and interesting. You can't get that concept of the cyclical time and the distortion of what actually happened into a mythic pattern of their culture of the repeated time from archaeology. The two don't give you that same picture. Now that gives you food to think about when you're considering a study of ancient times, ancient peoples, 
their theories, their philosophies, their culture, their understandings of something so simple as time. Well, yeah, you know, well, yesterday I went shopping. Today I went to work. Tomorrow I'm going to take the day off. We have this linear time. If we transfer that linear time philosophy of ours onto the ancient Mayans, we will never understand them. We can't force them to think like us and come to a proper understanding of them. Very interesting, isn't it? And finally, the context should be productive. Now, this is interesting. I love how he puts this, too. This is on page 9. Well, the final principle requires that when we do find complex correspondences in the Book of Mormon, then that context should tell us things about the Book of Mormon that we would otherwise miss. What he's driving at is this. It will effortlessly become the missing high context content. What this does, finding the extra context of the text, this helps explain the motivations, the actions, the events that otherwise remain puzzling to us. By gathering the greater context, the greater context helps us understand the text better than the text alone helps us understand the text. Isn't that interesting? So we will learn even more about the text of the scripture, whatever scripture it is, by studying the, what would you call them, the extracurriculars, studying the culture, studying the ancient politics as they understood it, studying the ancient warfare system, studying the ancient legal system, studying the ancient religion, studying the ancient nation craft, etc., 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 the ancient ship-faring, seafaring attitudes, how they did things. By acquiring an understanding of the overall culture through rigorous scholarship and analysis, then, knowing that broader picture, reading the text, we comprehend it even better. We go, oh, yeah, all right. Well, that's not how we would do this, but now I understand why they did this. That's, that's the importance of a rigorous analysis of all areas. What we want to do, see, look, the idea is simple. We want to explore the Book of Mormon, uh, the Pearl Great Price, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Malachi Codices, early Christianity. We want to explore with the maximum amount of knowledge and understanding. See, we, we don't want just the bare minimum. Yeah, we want to take 15 minutes a day and read the scripture and get it over with. Oh, get rid of that boredom so that we can go on with the real meaning of life, go to work. No, 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 no. no. We want the maximum knowledge. The way to comprehend the maximum amount of knowledge is to broaden first our attitudes and ourself, broaden the context into all the various fields of discipline that scholarship has given to us, and then our testimonies, our knowledge, and our faith expands. <laughs> you see, the mammal isn't greater than the intellect. The mammal is partners with the intellect. The mammal alone isn't good enough. The intellect alone isn't good enough. It's a partnership. It's a cooperation between scholarship and spirituality. And that expands the testimony. <laughs> I mean, man, you gotta love it. So anyway, thanks for watching my video. I'm sorry I uh, sound like a bumbling idiot. 
Uh, it's just because I am a bumbling idiot. That's all there is to it. That's what you get, you know. Take it or leave it. <laughs> so thanks for watching my videos, and I am excited. Uh, there is a world of information to share with you, man. This year is going to be a fun year exploring the Book of Mormon. So I will see you in the next videos.